I sang at my own wedding. I stood on the altar on an unseasonably warm January day, looked my bride in the eye, and I sang, how much do I love you? I'll tell you no lie. How deep is the ocean? How high is the sky? And I did not mean it. <laughs> Sarah wasn't showing yet, though they did need to alter the wedding dress a bit. That summer, she had found a book about natural birth control, and it captured her interest. She was against the pill, understandably so. I once heard that taking hormonal birth control is like cutting power to your house when you want to turn off the bathroom light. One humid Virginia Beach summer afternoon, a few weeks before we were to go back to our respective colleges, she came over, dressed in Victoria's Secret lingerie, and we had unprotected sex in my high school bedroom. <laughs> unprotected sex made me so nervous. <laughs> The horror stories they tell you in Christian school about the consequences of your sin. Plus, my younger brother already had a kid at 16. Condoms were fine by me. But I trusted her judgment. And if that method was vetted by her, then it must be fine. She read the book cover to cover. She took her temperature every morning and recorded it on a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet? <laughs> If that's not legit, I don't know what is. She was the most responsible 20-year-old I knew. <laughs> I was excited to get back to school. I'd just gotten into a pretty decent theater program. I'd finally found my people and a discipline. I felt my relationship had run its course. My attraction was fading, and I had much b bigger things to focus on. On the weekend, I finally worked up the courage to break up with her. She told me she was pregnant. So I kept my mouth shut. We went to one of those crisis pregnancy centers. They showed us an ultrasound of the heartbeat, and then they split us up to give their respective keep the baby sales pitches. A man in a lab coat took me out back where they had installed a pathetic looking basketball hoop and asked me, what are you going to do? Get married, keep the baby, raise the baby? Because that was the right answer. I wasn't going to be like these other pieces of shit that knock up their girlfriend and leave. I wasn't going to be that guy. I was ashamed of being a man. I've heard what people say about men. <laughs> In high school, I would read the stories in Seventeen magazine about mean, callous boys that would break these poor, innocent girls' hearts, boys that only stayed with a girl because they were physically attracted to them. All my life, I've taken extensive notes on how not to be. The contempt that evangelical Christianity has for artists and queerness and the oppressed, I paid very close attention to those lessons because you have to know what they're looking for. I think my most enduring and familiar fear is the fear of being found out. That and the fear of eternal damnation. That kind of shame is paralyzing. <laughs> Overachievement can be a survival mechanism. I needed to be seen by others as exceptional. Being told, you're not like other guys, those were magic words. I chose certain parts of my personality and built this person that was liked and accepted, all buried underneath a deep self-loathing. Maintaining this version of me was like a full-time job. I tried hard to be an exceptional husband. I encouraged her interests, and I knew them inside out so I could buy the perfect gifts. I cooked the majority of the meals. I changed most of the diapers. Whenever I saw her start to clean, I leapt up to join in. Every Saturday morning, I let her sleep in while I spent time with Alex. I fixed plumbing, renovated the kitchen, did the electrical work. I was employee of the month every single month. Lest you get the wrong idea, Sarah was a good mother. Home was very important to her. We laughed easily. We were politically aligned. She was a good partner. She just wasn't my person. I wasn't even my person. While I didn't want to be married, I loved being a father. From the start, I woke up with Alex in the morning and rocked him to sleep at night. I relished those Saturdays. At the butt crack of dawn, he'd creep into my room, nudge my shoulder, and say, Dad, let's eat cereal. 
We had our own little world of two. I was so invested in his development and very interested in making sure that he didn't have to fight the same things I did. Three years in, we had Luke. She wanted another baby, and the alternative was telling her that I didn't want to be with her anymore, so she got another baby. We got pregnant the first time we tried. You see, charting is good for something. <laughs> I loved them so much, and I poured everything into them. I taught them as much about the world as I could at every turn. Every fear I had, every wrong lesson, I was determined never to pass any of it down. I taught Alex how to manage his anger and that it was valid. I taught them how the world fit together. We normalized sex. I taught them how to look critically at art. We played music together. We acted in plays together. We laughed so much. And when the time came for them to be angsty teenagers, they could actually open up to me about the, what they were dealing with because we built that trust every step of the way. Just wait until your te their teenage years. They'll get mean and you won't know them. I was not going to be that guy. And I wasn't. I got a divorce when I was 30. I had approached this marriage with a spirit of duty and obligation. And at this point, that's all it was for me. I told her how I was no longer attracted to her, how I didn't want to waste her 30s as well as mine, how I had wanted to leave for so long. Over the years, my discontent would make itself known, but the conclusion of those discussions was that my dissatisfaction was always something for me to work on. In the divorce, I gave her everything she wanted. I asked for nothing. I'm grateful she was fair. I made sure the boys were with me half time because I wasn't going to be a weekend dad. People wouldn't slander me behind their back, call me just some other man, a man the way people spit that word out of their mouth. After the, the divorce, I started to date, but not seriously. I was slowly recovering, learning how to be an actual person. And then I met my kryptonite. Jennifer's narcissism and my shame, <laughs> my shame-based sense of obligation was a perfect fit. With her, I could never do anything right, let, let alone excel. Manipulation, lies, fake amnesia, and a false domestic violence charge as a parting gift. After three years, I was worn down to a nub. What progress I had made, gone. My sense of solitude, gone. My sense of safety, I spiraled. I lost my love of work. I receded socially, and while I've always had a melancholic temperament, one night I made the decision to end my life. I was just watching a glass blowing demonstration and then something broke within me. I had to leave. I was weeping uncontrollably. I sent a text to Sarah saying, if anything ever happens to me, please tell the boys that it was an accident. All these things I tried to spare them and a dad who killed himself was not going to slip through. Then my phone rang, it was my mom. 30 minutes later, I was in her living room, surrounded by everyone in my family. One month later, I had sold my house. Two months later, I packed up everything in my little VW bug and moved to, from Virginia Beach to Austin, Texas, having never even visited, but it felt right. Being in an unfamiliar place will show you who you really are versus all your well-worn habits, the grooves in an old marble staircase. They call Austin the oasis of Texas, and it was that for me, a, pa a place of rest, a green place to explore full of character and characters. I found people who welcomed me, who loved being around me. I dated a wonderful woman, a healer, another tender soul like me. We had a sexual chemistry that bordered on spiritual. It was a healthy relationship and a healthy breakup. When I was living back in Virginia, I had watched people I knew attend South by Southwest, and the shame would swallow me. I didn't get to do these things because I wouldn't, wasn't good enough. Well, I was hired by South by Southwest full time. I leaned in hard and I made a lasting impact. 
On my last day, I was told by the director of another department, we're really going to miss you. You have inspired people here. I wrote my boys a letter a week and saw them in person about six times a year. I was not going to lose them while I was saving myself. And the peace I got while I was there gave me the space to realize something about my shame and where it comes from. Both sides of my family have a history of abuse, addiction, narcissism, and a touch of that old time religion. <laughs> shame was my birthright, the sins of the fathers. But my immediate family, this little tribe, we also have a legacy of love. On this huge river of generational shame was a tiny little boat of kindness and curiosity and tenderness carried by outliers and black sheep and hard lovers. There is much fear in my family and a lot of hurt, but our true birthright is love. After two years I made a, in Austin, I made a soft landing, first to Richmond, Virginia, then back to Virginia Beach to see Alex and Luke through high school. It was their teenage years, and they knew me, and I knew them, and I got to provide a safe space for these beautiful boys. In 11th grade, my oldest got into his first relationship, and it was with great sadness that I witnessed him doing the same things <laughs> that I did, the same thing my father did, bending over backward to delight and accommodate, existing only for another, in order to earn the love that you don't think you deserve. Hiding away the tender and weird parts of yourself, it broke my heart because it was so familiar and there was nothing I could do. When she finally broke up with him, which needed to happen, I got to be there for him. He collapsed in a puddle in my arms and wept and wept. And it took me back to my first girlfriend, how much I yearned to be loved and how crushing your first breakup can be, but this time I knew the right things to say and more than that, he had the tools to pull himself out of the darkness. We had built the trust to be vulnerable with each other. I still struggle with shame. Replacing it with love is the work of a lifetime. I'm still on that long journey and I love looking back over my shoulder to see my kids walking a better path. Alex, my Byronic redhead with the tender soul, and Luke, my magical forest creature. <laughs> I truly believe that love can break cycles of shame. Give it up for Vamp first timer, Paul Costin.